As soon as we arrived at the farm of Tarue Secha, they were eager to show us around their organic tea fields. This farm was run with just two employees, a husband and wife, who started this venture out of their love for tea. They grow tea in their backyard, process it in a small factory next to their house, and they handle the business and tastings right inside their living room. When they first had kids 25 years ago, they were concerned about the pesticides they were putting on the field, so they decided to turn it completely organic. It was here that we were reminded about the essence of an organic tea field. The concept is simple. Take what exists on the land naturally and use that to grow tea. Rather than apply chemical fertilizers to the plants, the farmers here simply take the grasses that grow on the field naturally, clip them, and then use them as a fertilizer. They also trim old tea leaves and use them as a type of mulch. This simulates the natural order of the field. Nutrients are taken from the soil to produce the tea, and then they are returned to the soil to support next year's crop. But they don't just support the tea crop, they also support a variety of different plant species. Rather than bare soil, you will notice a carpet of green vegetation at the base of these tea plants. This is a good sign that the tea grown here is supporting a healthy ecosystem. Hey everybody, we just finished touring the fields here, and uh, I gotta say I'm pretty impressed. This is really a part of nature. Um, there's a lot of diversity of insect life and plant life at this field. Um, this has been completely organic for 25 years and I'm really interested to see what kind of tea they can produce. We're just doing a tasting right now at Tarue Secha. Um, I have a Yabukita Sencha here. Um, it's got a really nice color to it. It's um, kind of in between a jade green and a golden color. Um, and I get a little bit of this vegetal flavor in the beginning and it's got a little bit of a dry finish to it, but it's very fresh, very vegetal. Um, and it, just a little bit of dryness to it. So we're doing a tasting of two different teas. One is a hojicha, so this is a roasted green tea. Um, and then the other is a kocha, and this is a Japanese black tea. Um, so this is something that's a little bit rare, a little bit harder to find, but uh, we found a farmer that uh, grows the black tea here, and um, like right in this town here, and then has it processed somewhere else. And um, I'm very impressed with this black tea. It's got um, a little bit of this apricot note that I get from some other black teas that I've had in the past, and um, there's a tiny bit of a dryness towards the end. So I just got my first test. They presented me with this bowl of matcha and now I have to make it myself. Um, so there are some crumbs in here. So the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that I break all those up so they can form into the, um, the matcha. And then after I've scraped off the sides, I'm going to do a little M shape here. So basically what I'm doing right now is I'm aerating the matcha. So this is going to give it a smoother mouthfeel and a creamier taste. So you can see you got these very small bubbles here. Um, and that's really what you want. You want it to be, um, have a lot of air in there but not very big bubbles. You want the bubbles to be really small so it tastes almost like a latte. I think I did a good job. So um, we just got a pretty good demonstration of how a matcha mill works. Um, so this is a very, very small version uh, of the matcha mill. Um, these farmers purchased this to test it out um, to see how it works. And um, basically you have these grooves here that are gonna grind the tea into a fine powder. Um, so how this would work is you would put this there and then you would put tensha leaves into this hole right here. And then as you turn, 
the tencha leaves fall into the grooves and then they get pushed out as they're grind into a finer and finer powder. And then if you were using a larger matcha mill, the end product that you would get is this right here. So this is a very fine powder, um, which can only come from a full scale matcha mill. Although the organic fields were beautiful and the tea was delicious, we needed to get back on the road to visit the next farmer on our list. We would be heading to the next town to visit Zen Koen, a small family farm in the countryside of Shizuoka. The farmer here shared a similar philosophy with regards to organic farming. His goal was to restore the natural order to the tea field and make sure that it does not disrupt the local flora and fauna. One way he was able to achieve this goal was through the use of natural fertilizer. So here we are in the workshop at uh, Zen Koan and uh, we have a few different types of fertilizers that they use here. All of them are organic. So um, this right here is a charcoal fertilizer. Um, so you can see this is kind of like a burnt wood um, in little tiny chips here. And then over here, we have a, a mineral fertilizer made from um, plants and shells and things like that. Um, and then this is actually kombu or kelp. So this is like a kelp based fertilizer. And um, what they're going to do is they're going to mix all of these together in a certain ratio. And that's going to be the fertilizer that they put on the plants every November. Just as the sun was beginning to set, we were given a first-hand demonstration of this natural ecosystem at work. These two creatures standing in between the bushes of the tea field are siro, a type of wild goat native to this part of Japan. Organic tea fields are always teeming with life, but this was by far the biggest animal I have seen on one. Because the soil here is so healthy, it is able to support a dense carpet of vegetation around the tea field. These siro came out of the forest to graze here, to us, this was only further validation that organic farming is the way to go. We want to source our tea from fields that not only give life to tea plants, but also give life to all the animals that live around them. So those animals that you just saw were coming here to feast on some of the foliage. Um, so like as you can see here, um, this is something that some of the wild animals would come around to eat. There's also some wild pigs that will actually uh, dig through this soil and um, eat some of the earthworms and grubs from the soil. Um, so this is something you would only see on a completely organic farm where other plant life is allowed to flourish. Um, so as you can see here, we're really deep in the countryside. Uh, this is not those flat manicured fields that you see elsewhere. Um, this really is part of nature. Another unique feature of this tea field was that it was tucked away into the mountains. This has a special effect on the tea plants as they are partially shaded throughout the day. When tea plants are cut off from sunlight, they tend to produce more chlorophyll and theanine. This alters not only the color of the tea, but the taste as well. Shaded teas tend to be sweeter and smoother than their unshaded counterparts. Another advantage to mountain tea fields is the soil. This soil here is a lot more rocky and that can improve the tea as well. We're, we're kind of at a higher elevation right now and we got this kind of rocky mountain soil here. So we've seen this at, at other farms where you have a lot of this um, you know, rocky soil which is bringing a lot of nutrients um, to the tea. So this is going to have a very distinct characteristic as a mountain tea. After walking around the tea fields for only an hour, I was already very impressed with this tea farm. However, the true test of the tea would happen in the tasting room. So, uh, as you can see here, we have a lot of different teas to try. Um, we have two Fukumushi style senchas, so these are deep steamed senchas. Um, during the deep steaming process, it takes away a lot of the bitterness. Um, so we're really noticing that these are actually quite smooth. There's almost no bitterness in here at all. Um, and then we have a hojicha, so a roasted green tea. Um, we have a kocha, which is a Japanese black tea. And then we have a uh, hojigemaicha, which is a, a roasted tea mixed with toasted rice. So 
Um, this is actually the first time I've ever even heard about this tea, and I'm trying it now for the first time. Um, this one is, I would say it's actually kind of buttery, very smooth, very sweet. Um, with this one here, the kocha, the black tea, um, I would say it's got a lot of sweetness to it, a little bit of fruitiness, and it's just got a slight lingering astringency at the end, but it's really quite nice. To truly understand the importance of organic green tea, you simply need to go to the field itself. Every tea field tells a story, and these two told a story of humility and respect for nature. The farmers are careful not to take too much from the land or introduce anything that would disrupt the natural order. The animals here are allowed to go about their lives, finding food in the soil and taking shelter between the bushes. As important as tea is to us, it is not more important than the livelihood of these animals. This area of Japan is abundant enough for both to coexist, and when it comes to our tea, we wouldn't want it any other way. We spent the night in Shizuoka to rest up for our next day. In the morning, we would be heading to Hamamatsu and continuing our quest to find the best organic green tea.